If you've got a Bible there, can you turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel? Turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel this morning. I'm just going to pray for us real quick. Lord, I just pray right now. Father, would you just open our ears to hear something that you want to say to us? Open our eyes to see something we haven't seen. Lord, open our hearts, God. Would you challenge us this morning? God, would you uh, take us another step further on our journey of being disciples, Lord? God, bring into our world right now whatever it is that you want to bring through this word. Speak to each person here in a language they would understand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Samuel chapter 17. We've got a story here about a great man of God um, and a great exploit, a great thing. And, and I don't, it doesn't matter whether you've been around church for 80, 90 years or whether you've maybe just gone to Sunday school. I'll guarantee that every single one of us have heard about the story of David and Goliath. All of us would have heard the story about David and Goliath. I've been thinking about this story for a couple of months now. It's just been sort of sitting in the back of my mind and I go back and I have a bit of a look at it and read it. And there's something in the story that has really stood out to me recently. And I want to talk to you this morning about faith and something else, all right? Faith and something else. And the story is a very simple one. We all know that, that David's brothers go out to war. And they're fighting in the army and Saul's the king. They're fighting against the Philistines. And uh, David's father sends him out and says, take some food out there and find out what's going on and come back and just give me word. Let me know that the the boys are doing okay. And so David um, leaves his sheep. He's he's, he's shepherding sheep. He leaves the sheep, gets his food, runs out to the battlefield. And he, he goes out. And when he gets out there, there's this standoff, Mexican standoff type situation happening between the Philistines and the Jews. And David being a little bit of a, I guess, a, his brothers would, would think he was a pesky, annoying. Anyone got a little brother? Anyone? Anyone, anyone want to be honest and think your little brother can be? Yeah, okay, Michael, put your hand down, Michael, I got the point. Um, I got a little brother. And that little brother, oh, you want, they want to be in everything and involved in everything. And maybe that's what the older boys thought of David, that he was just trying to poke his nose into business that was not his own. Anyone here, a younger brother? Is anyone here who is the younger brother? Ah, oh, that makes sense. Okay. I, yeah, I can believe that you were the younger brother, actually, Rod. That's, yes. Well, you know what? A lot of things are dropping for me. Thank you, Lord. Penny's, things are making sense, taking shape that I didn't think of before. Awesome. And so David's there and he's poking around and he, he, he wants to find out what is going on. And a soldier says, well, here's the deal. There's, there's a, you know, the Philistines have got this big dude called Goliath. And what they're challenging is just, let's just do a one-on-one sort of cage fight here between Goliath and you send out your best soldier and they can battle it out. And whoever wins is the winner. And whoever loses, obviously, you'll become subservient to that nation. And so David hears this and his brother is a bit, you know, go home, what are you doing here? But David hears this and something rises up on the inside of him. And David looks at this situation and ends up putting his hand up and going, pick me, pick me, pick me. And so David gets picked, and we all know the story. He gets taken in, and Saul goes to put his armor on him. And, you know, David throws the armor off because you've just got to be yourself, don't you? Yeah? You've got to be yourself. Whatever it is that you're doing uh, for God, you're doing it, not somebody else. So don't try to be somebody else in the midst of whatever it is that you do. We we, we get called. We we, we all do it, don't we? We get called to do something or uh, something in life. you, 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 You become this or that, and we look at what the people that do it the best look like and how they do it, and we all want to copy them. And and that's okay, learn from them, but stay true to who you are as a person. And so David flings off this armor and decides that he's just going to go out uh, to battle with with what he has, which is just himself. And he drops the shield and the the sword and all that stuff. And he picks up, he's got a sling. Anyone ever uh, thrown a sling before? Yeah, a few people thrown, did you hit anything? Did you have to pay for it afterwards? I remember when I was a young boy, I lived uh, uh, for a little bit of time out at Evans Head and I had a mate of mine and his name was George Wilkinson. And George was the sling king. He was the greatest. He was my age. We were only 12 at the time, but I'm telling you right now, we'd go out and you can't do this these days because we don't want people to get hurt and everything. Remember the days when you could go to the rubbish tip and you didn't have to pay? Anyone remember those days? You didn't have to pay to dump your rubbish. Now you've got to pay. I remember back in those days, because my dad used to take us to the rubbish, and we would come home with other people's rubbish. That's what my dad would do. It was just, and it's probably still, my wife would say it's still in me, and if I could do that, I probably still would go in, and because there's always, you can find use in all this other stuff. One person's rubbish is another person's 
gold, you know. Uh, we're all a bit like that with God. And um, so anyway, George Wilkinson, he ha- we had these slingshots that we'd made, and George was amazing. We'd go out to the tip and lift up sheets of iron to find brown snakes and stuff, and then we would shoot the snakes. So I'm not encouraging it. Do not do it. Uh, but George was really good. I remember we would sneak up on birds, and a bird would take off, and this is a 12-year-old boy, and George would get his stone in his, in his slingshot, pull it back, and he would just go, bang. And he'd hit the poor bird in the belly as it was flying. He was amazing. I've never seen anybody that was such a good shot. He's probably the closest person I know to David when I read about David and this amazing feat of hitting this guy, Goliath, with a stone. But it says in 1 Samuel 17, 40, as David, he's made the decision that he's going to go out and he's going to fight. He's decided this is what I'm going to do. And here's what he does just on his way towards uh, taking on Goliath. It says, then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, how many of you know that David is a great man of faith? We know that, don't we? Because we go on, and, and at this point, whoever's there live at this event doesn't know what's going to happen in David's life. Right? right now, they're living this moment. So they don't know what David's going to become. Just like you don't know what your children are going to become right now if they're this big. You can have dreams and visions and thoughts, but you don't know what they're going to become. And so here's David at this point, but we know he's going to go on to be a great man of faith. But it kind of starts here. We know that David had great faith even here. Go back a couple of verses, verse 34 to 36, and it says this. It says, but David said to Saul, this is when Saul's trying to to, to say, you know, you're up for this and so on. He says this, he says, your servant, as in me, David, I've been keeping my father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it, I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. In other words, this guy has no covenant relationship. Remember in the Old Testament, God had a a, a covenant, a, a relationship with a nation. In the New Covenant, it's different. God has a relationship with anyone from any nation that chooses to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we're talking two different agreements between God and man, but under this agreement, what David was saying was, hey, we are the people that have this relationship with you. This guy doesn't. How dare he come up against you? He he said, you're not just coming up against the Jewish army. He said, you're coming up, the Israeli army, you're coming up against God. And so because of that, I know this. When you come up against God, you don't win. I know this, I've got enough faith to know this, that if, if you want to take on God, you are going to lose. This is what he's saying. And with that, from that standpoint, he says, I am representing God. So I have great faith that I know who's going to come out on top in this battle. So David has great, great faith. But here's the question. Even though David was full of faith, he still felt the need to grab five stones. Here's this man full of faith. I'm going to kill this giant. But when he goes to the stream, it, it's very clear that David felt the need to grab five stones. Now, if you pick up Bible commentaries and, and research and so on, why five stones? And this is my question today, why five stones? Well, here are some of the reasons I've come across. Um, one of them was that five stones represented the personal habits by which David defeated Goliath. I just can't imagine Goliath bend, David bending down at the stream going... There's Goliath, my heart's palpitating out of my chest. I'm going up against that really, really big, strong, trained guy. I'm going to bend down and I'm going to go, geez, what were the five habits that are... I'm going to take a stone for each of the habits that have got me to this point in my life. It's a great sentiment and maybe there's a great teaching out of that. I just can't imagine if I'm David in that moment, I'm not bending down to pick up them stones thinking, I'm going to take one for every good habit I have. It's not going to cross my mind in real time anyway. The other reason, another reason I came across was the five stones were for Goliath's four brothers. The Goliath had four brothers. And if Goliath was taken out, then his brothers might be really, really annoyed at that. And so they're going to come charging. So he's going to go stone number two, number three, number four, number five. Now look, we do know that Goliath had brothers because later on, I think, uh, later on in, in Samuel, we hear about uh, a man that killed one of Goliath's brothers. So we do know Goliath had at least one brother. We don't know about the rest. 
Maybe that was true. Maybe he did look around and maybe when he bent down, he grabbed a stone, then went to get up and went, oh, hang on, there's four really, really big dudes that have We Love Goliath on their shirts. They must be his brothers. So they bent back down and grabbed another force. Maybe that's possible. It's possible. But I'm just trying to put myself in real time. What is David thinking when he bends down and he picks up them stones? Maybe he was simply preparing himself for whatever came next. Maybe it wasn't the brothers, but maybe just thinking, okay, the army's going to come charging at me when Goliath drops, and I'm just going to have enough time, I reckon, between where they are, enough time to maybe load up four more before it's all over. And then hopefully, when Goliath drops, the Israeli army come in and, and I'm safe. Maybe. Maybe. But here's another reason that I'm thinking about when I put myself in David's shoes. And for me, this is a more plausible reason. It's a very simple one. He gathered five because he realized that he just might have missed with the first one. Maybe he gathered five stones because he thought, even though I'm full of faith, the reality of the fact is I still might miss on my first throw. And so if I miss on my first throw, this guy's still going to be coming at me. So I better make sure I've got a couple of others in the sling bag there so that if I miss, I pick up another and I throw again. And if I miss, well, I'll pick up another and I'll throw again. Maybe David had five stones simply because he realized we're human beings and sometimes we can miss it. And it doesn't matter how much faith you have, you can miss it. Amen? You can miss it. God never promised that he would kill our Goliath with the first stone. We don't have a promise anywhere there that we're aware of where God said to him, as a matter of fact, we do not even have a promise from God that he was going to kill him on the second or third. We don't even have a word from God that God said to David, pick up stones and do it that way. We don't know. There's a lot of things about this story that we simply don't know. But what we do know is that this man of faith who had already said, I know, I know Goliath's going to go down, felt the need to pick up five stones. And I think maybe because he realized that even with faith, you can miss it. And when you miss it, what do you do? Well, you load up another stone and you throw again. You load up another stone and you go again. God never promised he'd kill him with the first stone, never promised he'd kill him with a stone. And here's the reality for you and me today. God never promises us that we'll get everything we want. He doesn't promise us that we'll win every battle or that we'll succeed in every endeavor or that we'll reach the summit of every mountain or that we'll crack every code or we'll have every prayer answered or we'll understand everything we read or we'll operate in every gift, or we'll receive every promise, or we'll break every habit, or we'll beat every sin, or we'll keep every resolution. Just because we're Christians, we have faith and we turned up. How many of you, know, how many of you believe that? You're Christian, you got faith and you turned up, but it still didn't work. It still didn't work. See, I think we need more than just faith. I think we need more than just being Christians, and it needs to be more than just simply turning up. David had something that was a part of his faith, and it was called resilience. David, I believe, had resilience. David's attitude was, I'm going to kill Goliath, or I'm going to die trying. I'm going to take him down, or he's going to take me down. But if I miss with the first stone, I'm not going to sit there and cry about it. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to tweak God's word to fit my situation. I'm going to load up another stone. I'm just going to throw again. And if I miss a second time, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull out another stone and I'm going to go again and again and again. David had a great spirit of resilience. David was a resilient person with a capacity to just keep on going. Anyone seen um, Finding Nemo? You know that? Yep. Nemo, like that, not, not, Dory. Dory's one of the most resilient characters in the history of TV. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Didn't matter what happened to Dory. Forget this, setback, problem. Dory forgot it real quick and just kept swimming, just kept swimming. Dory was like David. Dory would just pick up another stone, put it in the flipper and just flip another stone out and get on with life. Dory wasn't going to be held back. But David's attitude was that if I miss the first time, I'll just have another go. And then another one, then another one. What an amazing attitude to have. You see, it's not enough for us just to have faith. Faith's amazing and faith is important. And without faith, we can't please God. But we need to have resilience alongside of our faith if we really want to be who we're meant to be and do what we're meant to do. 
If we really want to make a difference in our generation, in our communities, in our time, it's going to take more than just turning up, being a Christian and having faith. You are going to have to develop resilience in your Christian life if you are going to do the things God wants you to do and be the person God wants you to be. You see, a great life with God requires more than just faith. You need to have a resilient spirit. Who remembers when their first child was born? Anyone with kids? When your first child is born, right? I remember when we first had Caleb. I was under the impression, now I know scientifically this is impossible, right? I know, I understand enough about biology to know that this is not true. But this is what I thought. I dead set thought that Caleb was actually made of porcelain. I thought he was made of porcelain. I didn't want to drop him, bump him, didn't want him to get hurt. You, you, you walk around like that first child is made of porcelain. Because you think that the slightest bit of impact or the slightest bit of misadventure and this kid is going to crack like dropping a coffee cup on a tiled floor. How many of you had more than one child? By the time I got to Chloe, child number four, I'd come to the conclusion, my children aren't made of porcelain. They're made of rubber. Because they just, doesn't matter what happens, guess what? They get up and life goes on. They break an arm at heels, life goes on. They get disappointment, they get over it, life goes on. Life just keeps on going. They, like Dory, for some capacity and somehow, manage to just keep swimming, keep swimming, keep swimming. And I think each of us, need to ask ourselves the question, are we like porcelain? Well, when we hit a disappointment, do we just break? Do we just give up? If we get defeated, do we just throw the towel in? If it doesn't work the first time, do we just stop? If we don't get what we want, do we just bow to it? Or are we like rubber? If I was to throw a rubber ball against that wall, what would it do? It'd bounce back, wouldn't it? If I threw a coffee cup against that wall, what would it do? It's just going to shatter and smash into a million pieces. We need to be like rubber. We need to be the kind of people that have the capacity to bounce back. And that's what resilience is. Resilience is about bouncing back. In fact, I found an article in uh, Positive Psychology in January 2019. And they said this about bounce back. It said, bounce back is what we do when we face disappointment, defeat and failure. But instead of wallowing or letting these things keep us down, we get back up and continue on with our lives. We get back up and we continue moving forward with our lives. What's Proverbs 24 verse 16 says this. It says, For though the righteous fall seven times. Look at that. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. Anyone notice the seven times bit? Who falls seven times? The righteous. The righteous fall seven times. Let me tell you something. You are either on the ground right now and you need to get back up, or you've just got back up, but you're going to fall again. Or you've just fallen and you... the righteous are going to fall seven times. In other words, don't look at someone just because they got defeated or disappointed or fell down and wipe them and think that, that, that it's a reflection of faith. It's not. People full of faith will fall. The righteous will fall. But the difference between a righteous person when they fall and what he's saying here, a wicked person when they fall, is the righteous people get back up. You ever heard the term get back on the horse? I remember years and years ago, uh, my wife uh, uh, borrow, uh, uh, took our car. We just bought this. Anyone, anyone have a Magna? We had an early model. Yeah, I know, I know. I just I didn't want to pull that face till someone no, knew no one had one. Anyone got a Magna? No. Good! Anyway, we had an early model Magna, right? And it had all sorts of problems. Anyway, long story short, one day uh, I was at home and my wife said, I'm going to go shopping at a shopping centre in Brisbane. So she jumps in the car and she drives down to the shopping centre and, and she's gone for a bit and I'm in the bathroom and she gets home and she comes in and she's all distressed and panicking. And I'm thinking someone's died, you know, like this is, this is something. And she goes, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. Anyway, long story short, she was... Back, were you backing in or going, you were going forward? Wow, that's, oh, gosh. I was trying to protect you. I thought you were going backwards. She was going forwards. So she was going forwards to park a car and didn't see, you know the little, they, used, they have big ones now. They used to be little um, bars where they put the shopping trolleys in and they were about that big and you couldn't really see them. So she's turned in and right up the side of the car. And she came in to me and she was adamant. She said to me, I'm never driving again. I'm not going to drive anymore, blah, blah, blah. 
So I sat there and thought, you know what, no, you've got to, when things happen in life, you've got to pick yourself back up, don't you? And you've got to go again. I'm not talking about denying feelings, not talking about denying emotions, not talking about denying any pain or hurt. What I'm saying, though, at some point, we've got to get back up again and keep living. At some point, we've got to get back up and we've got to keep moving forward. And so I sat there and I said to her, and I, don't, I, I didn't need anything at the shop at all. And I don't remember what it was, but I said to her while I was in the bath, oh, hang on, look, can you go back for a second? I really need blah, milk, was it? I said, I really need some milk. And we didn't need milk. But she was too frantic to call my bluff and look in the fridge and go, we don't need milk. She said, no, I'm not going. I said, no, no come on, just, 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 it doesn't matter. Just jump in the car and go back and get some milk for us, would you? So she did. And I was, of course, in the bath, so that was a good excuse. I couldn't go. And so she got back in the car and went. Because we've got to get straight back in to life. I'm not saying don't have a break. I'm not saying sometimes we don't need a pause. But what I'm saying is if we have that capacity where something can break us completely and we don't know how to bounce back, it can literally... See, David had five stones. David knew one of two things was going to happen. He was going to keep going and keep throwing or Goliath was going to get to him and end his life. And many people, when we get a setback or a defeat or a failure, literally, figuratively, our physical life may not end, but that part of our life dies because we just simply give up. We give up on that. We don't have resilience. We don't know how to bounce back. We haven't cultivated a resilient spirit in our life. The righteous fall. They're going to fall. It's not a failure to fall, but it's a failure to not get back up. You've got to get back up, and you've got to keep going. No matter what that thing is, whether it be uh, in, in the spiritual area of life, whether it's believing a, dr- a dream, God's spoken something to you, a dream, a vision, something. And it's set back up, the set back up, the set back. Just keep getting up because you don't know which stone's going to connect eventually. But if God said it, keep getting up. Maybe it's a, a resolution or a habit. How many of you know New Year's resolutions? Every one of us, we're all going to go to the gym. We're all going to eat healthy. We're all going to do that. Yeah, we're, we're pretty much universal, the same resolutions every year. There are industries built on it. But then we get six weeks in and statistically about 85% of people have stopped them and we give up. Then we feel like, well, we'll wait till next year and we'll pump our tires up again with with January 1 and we'll go again. And some people, after a couple of years, you just give up and you stop. If you want to get fit, guess what? You can still get fit. Just get up and go again. Have another crack at it. You want to eat healthy? You can still eat healthy. Get up and have another crack at it. I I was talking to a guy the other day. He rang me up a week ago, this guy. Lovely man of God. He rings me up in tears. And he said, Alan, uh, long story short, I've I've been seeing this, this, this lady... And she's just out of the blue sent me a text message and gone, it's over, don't want to see you again. Poor way to do it. But this is what she did. And he was shattered. And I didn't realize at the time, I rang him about four days later to have another chat with him. And he told me, he said, that f- when, you, when you rang me that first day, he said, I was looking for a gun. I didn't want to go again. That was enough. By the time I'd spoken to him four days later, it was such a wonderful conversation. What he said to me was, he was talking to me in, in, in the sense that, you know, rather than giving up on finding love, rather than giving up on finding love, which he was going to do four days earlier, he said, you know what, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm getting back on the horse. He's not, he's not a perv, he's not trying to chase people, don't think that. But what he was saying was, I'm not going to close my heart off and give up on ever finding intimacy with a lovely woman for the rest of my days. I'm not going to do that. Yet how many people do that kind of stuff? We get hurt, we get disappointed in any area of life and we basically shut ourselves down. Effectively, we die. We kill ourselves in that area of life because we don't know how to bounce back. We don't realize that faith is not enough. You need to have resilience in this Christian life as well if you're going to do the things God wants you to do and be the person that God wants you to be. You have to have resilience. You see, falling is just as important a part of life as standing up is. We learn lessons on top of a mountain, don't we? We, 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 we enjoy that and we, and, we, and we learn things about ourselves and the world around us, but we also learn things when we fall. The righteous fall seven times, but they get back up. And every time they fall, they learn something. They learn something. Falling is not the end. It's not the end. We've got to pick ourselves back up and keep moving forward in life. Romans 5.3, Paul says this, not only so, he says, but we also glory in our sufferings. Who, who glories in their sufferings? I don't. I hate my sufferings. I fight my sufferings. I want to remove my sufferings. I want to alleviate my sufferings. I want to push my sufferings to the side. I want to ignore my sufferings. I want to find something that makes me happy, happy, happy to forget the suffering. I want something to smother the suffering. And here Paul says, I actually glory in the sufferings that we go through. 
But then he tells us why he glories in the sufferings. He says, I glory in sufferings. Why? Because I know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance is, is, is another way of saying resilience. Paul says, I glory in suffering because I know that every time that comes my way, that, that roadblock comes, that speed bump comes, he says, you know what? It's building this, this perseverance. It's building resilience in me so that I get stronger and I learn my lessons, but I keep on moving. And I need the suffering. I need the resistance. I need those things because it's part of forming me into the person I'm meant to be, which is a person that's made more like rubber than porcelain, a person who will bounce back not break every time something happens that I don't like. The suffering could be persecution, could be disappointment, could be unmet expectations, could be failure, could be testing, could be a setback, could be any number of things. I don't know what it is for you, but have you picked yourself back up and are you moving forward again? These things that happen are meant to produce forward momentum in our lives. This is what Paul's saying. So that the, the sufferings produce perseverance, resilience. In other words, the sufferings are things that are meant to keep me moving forward, not stop me in my tracks. But for so many of us, they stop momentum in our life and they stop us in our tracks. And that's not what they're meant to do. Here's a couple of other verses in the New Testament uh, that speak about resilience and perseverance. Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not give up, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest. When? If we don't give up. In the proper time, there's a timing, but you've got to not give up. So if you're going to give up, guess what? You, you, you may not get it. Unresilient people miss out on their harvest. We give up. Paul says, you know what, you'll reap a harvest, but he says there's a condition. You've just got to keep going. You've got to just keep swimming, keep swimming, get up, pick up another stone, try again, pick up another stone, try again. Don't bow to it. Don't give into it. Keep moving. Unresilient people miss out on their harvest. What could we be missing out on because we're not bouncing back? We've got to be people who bounce back. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, the writer says this. He says, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what he's promised. In other words, unresilient people fail to fully participate in the will of God in their world, in their generation. If you're not resilient, you will not participate in what God wants to do in your world and in your generation. He says, if you don't persevere, you'll never complete the will of God for your life. Because there will be setbacks and there will be resistance. It is a part of life and it's a normal part of life. And just because we're Christian, we have faith and we turn up, doesn't mean that they won't stand in front of us. They do. It's part and parcel. For 2 Peter 1.6, Peter's listing these things, saying that as believers, these are things that we should be adding and bringing into our world. And lo and behold, he says that one of those things, add to knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance. Somewhere in that hierarchy of things that Peter believes is an important part of our world that needs to be added into who we are to build us into the men and women of God he wants us to be. Somewhere in that mix, in that recipe, he says there's a bit of resilience and perseverance in there. And if you don't add it, you won't be complete. You won't grow into everything that you're meant to do because life is going to set you back. You are righteous. You are going to fall. But will you get back up? Without resilient spirit, you won't. You won't get back up. Resilience is something that we need to add to our lives. James says a few things about it. James 1.4, he says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking nothing. In other words, resilience is needed in order for you to become mature and complete. Let me tell you this. You cannot avoid building resilience, even though you live in a world and a culture right now that is trying to tell you you can We don't want children to be disappointed in a race so everybody gets a participation certificate. So the kid that actually was the fastest doesn't experience the joy of working hard and being the, the fastest and the children that weren't don't experience uh, what it means to actually learn how to process the fact that somebody was better than you at something and that's normal because I don't care how good you are at anything, someone's better than you. There's always someone better than you and part of a normal life is to grow up realising you can't be the best at everything but that is okay, it's normal. So everyone gets a participation thing. We're trying to legislate now in the world anything that, that makes you feel disappointed. We're, we're coming up with laws so that you don't feel disappointed. We're going to come up with a law so that this kind of person doesn't feel hurt. Come up with a law so this kind of person doesn't feel rejected. We are trying to legislate resilience out of the world. And what's going to happen is one day we're going to get to a point where we've got a world full of people who are unresilient. And what do you think it's going to look like then? 
Here's what I think. The culture and season we live in right now, what a great opportunity. What a great opportunity for men and women of God to build resilience in their world and to be the kind of people that aren't going to walk around being easily offended and easily hurt and disappointed. We're going to be the kind of people that have extra stones in our pouch and we're going to pull out another and go again. We're not going to let all these things kill us because we have no resilience on the inside of us. What a great opportunity for the church to shine a light in the world right now. When everybody's going, I'm disappointed, I'm hurt, I'm sad, oh, we're sorry, let's protect. No, 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 it's a part of life and it's going to happen. And we need to learn how to bounce back. And this is a great opportunity for the church right now, this day and age that we live in. It's a great opportunity for the church to be a great witness. Perseverance finishes its work. Resilience is doing work inside of you. Let resilience do its work. Don't resist it. Don't fight it. Let resilience do it. James goes on further in James 5.11. He says, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. In other words, we count as blessed those who have been resilient. He says, you've heard of Job's perseverance. And have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So those who develop resilience in the end, guess what? You are blessed. If you learn to develop resilience in your life, at the end of that journey, there is blessing from God. God will bless you. Those who develop resilience are blessed people. Ever thought about the journey of Paul the Apostle? Ever thought about Paul's journey? How much resilience do you think a guy like Paul had to have? in the midst of a culture that he was ministering in, dealing with the AIDS, the things that were happening and so on. The church was not the popular people. He was going into places that didn't have the gospel there, the people that didn't love Jesus, that were worshipping idols. Paul gives us a little bit of his resume, uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 28. He says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. And what did he do? He pulled out another stone, had another crack had a setback, pulled out another stone, put it in his sling and said, I'll go again. And then he goes on. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open ocean. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and more often gone without food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else I face daily. The pressure of my concern for all the churches. Let me tell you something. That guy had a bag. He had a backpack full of stones. That man had a backpack full of stones. How many of us would have given up after the first shipwreck? How many of us would have given up after the first stoning? How many of us would have given up after missing the first meal, let alone being starved for days and not having food? How many of us would have laid down and given up that area or that part of our world and just let it die? But Paul didn't. He kept on pressing on. He kept on pressing on because Paul had faith. He turned up. He was a believer, but he had resilience as well. And we need both. We need faith and we need resilience. We need faith and we need resilience in our life. Paul had a few stones that missed when he threw them, But praise God, he had a lot of extra ones. And he reached in, he picked them up, and he went again. Are Are you like Paul? Are you like David? Do you have enough stones in your bag to pick another one out today and to throw it again and to throw it again and to not let that area of your life die, to not give up? Why did David grab five stones? I think it's very simple. He knew you're going to miss occasionally. It's normal. It's not a slide on your faith, on your character. You're going to fall short. We all do. We are saved by grace through faith. None of us is perfect. None of us are who we're meant to be yet. But it's not an excuse to lay down. We need to keep getting back up. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. He says we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. I'm persecuted. I'm not abandoned. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. And just like Paul, we're hard-pressed on every side today. We can be perplexed. Persecution is getting worse and worse where we are. And we can be struck down. But here's the thing, but we're not crushed. Paul says we're not in despair. We're not abandoned. And we won't be destroyed if you have resilience, if you have a resilient spirit. We've got to cultivate a resilient spirit in our world. Otherwise, there are some things that you'll just never, ever see in this life. There are things you will never achieve. There are victories you will never experience. 
There are mountains you will never climb. There are obstacles you will never overcome. There are goals you will never accomplish if you don't get some resilience in your life. I'll finish with Malachi chapter 7, verse 8. I love this verse. Malachi, uh, Micah, sorry, Micah 7, 8. Malachi. Micah 7, 8. He says, Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. I, I pray, everyone in this room, that you have the testimony of Micah. Because here's the thing, you will fall. It's a given. I don't care how holy you think you are, how perfect you think you are, how good you think you are, you are still suffering from the same disease as me. you still got a lot of humanity floating around inside of you. You will fall. Though the righteous fall seven times, but they get back up. Don't gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Is that your testimony today? Is that what's inside of you? Are you saying to yourself, yep, I've fallen, but I'm going to get up again. Yes, I've stumbled, but I'm going to get back up again. What's reverberating around on the inside of you at the moment in those areas where maybe you've let those areas die? And I just feel challenged this morning to challenge you, and I'm challenging myself. Rise back up in those areas. Don't give up. Because as long as you're still breathing oxygen, there's more for you in this life. If you're still breathing here this morning, and I'm hoping all of you are, I'm hoping. There's more to go. Amen? God still has things for us to do. He still has things to bring into our world. He still has processes, things he wants. He wants to shape me more and more into the image of his son so I can be a greater reflection of Jesus Christ out there in the community that he's called me to serve. Have you fallen recently? And do you need to get back up? So just like David, if you don't pick up another stone, put it in your pouch and swing, it's going to cost you your life in those areas. 